do three on each couch. In case your own machines or anything don't get it, we can provide a free transcript and recording of it. Or did David sound? Yes. Yes. Experience. Yes. Good to see you looking so well, sir. I feel good. Terrific. Good. You had a good trip yesterday? Yes. 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 It's quite a <laughs> Oh, no. more, more than that, I uh, see I met him twice in the Vatican. I met him once uh, early morning in Alaska when our planes were literally coming in and coming out uh, for refueling at the same time. Uh, most recently was at, uh, at the Vatican in uh, this year in June in the Economic Summit and then here. But, uh, we were this. Yeah. Mr. President, we, we do want to thank you for the opportunity to come. We appreciate your time. Uh, we know your schedule is limited, so we'd like to jump right in if we can. Let's Mike, go. Mike Kramer just wrote a cover story on, on the good Mr. Bork, and I think he has a he has first question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Biden has been criticized for having prejudged Bork before the hearings even begin. Do you think he and the Democrats are established something of a hanging jury? Well, it's hard for me to believe in their sincerity, particularly when you read Senator Biden's statement about Bork when he was supporting him for his appointment to the second highest court in the land, the Court of Appeals here in the District of Columbia. He not only went out of his way to endorse him and speak that he was the best qualified for the job, but he took on those people who were opposing that appointment at the time on the basis of uh, his political ideology or whatever, and declared that they were really out of bounds. Now, uh, I don't know what's changed him other than maybe the fact that being a candidate does things to you. You mean he wants to sit here? What? That he wants to sit here. <laughs> but uh, I, I found this hard to go. And when you look at who all is endorsing him based on the record, here is a man who had at least a hundred of his decisions forwarded onto the Supreme Court from the Cir Circuit Court of Appeals, all of them sustained by the Supreme Court. Uh, I think he has every qualification uh, for the job. Uh, you said when announcing your uh, nomination of him that he agreed with you on a number of important social issues. One of those is abortion. It'll come up again probably in this coming term. Uh, do you expect Bork to overturn the road decision? I don't know, and I don't know that he would even answer such a thing until he's faced with a case and what all it is. My feeling about that issue is, well, for one thing, I have a personal feeling uh, of my own having had to face that as a governor, that particular issue, that we are indeed taking a human life. I think all medical evidence, without any controversy, agrees with that, that the uh, unborn child is a living entity, uh, the very fact of extremely premature births that then go on and live and grow up successfully is, is evidence of that. But aside from that, uh, I believe that this was another of the court decisions that altered the relationship between state and federal governments. I believe very strongly that we are a federation of sovereign states, and that was an issue that just as uh, murder uh, is a state issue. Uh, this was a that this should be returned to the state authorities. Where well, would you be disappointed if Bork didn't vote to overturn Roe? Oh, I'm not going to. I can't make an answer to a question like that. Uh, but you would like to see Roe overturned. Well, you I, think it should be overturned? Yourself. Yes, because I think it should be turned back to the states where it belongs. We, in other areas, you know, we have a program of trying to uh, restore the. Uh, uh, the federal the federalism. I'm not the first one that tried to do that. Back in 1932, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt announced as part of his campaign that he would like to see the federal government restore to the states and local communities authority and autonomy that had been unjustly seized by the federal government. His record in office indicated a slight change in that view. But <laughs> I don't know whether he changed in his view or whether a bureaucracy with all the emergency acts was created that began to go its own way. Uh, 
Mr. President, uh, we seem to be on the verge of an INF agreement with the Soviet Union, and we've just uh, uh, apparently come to an agreement on a more minor uh, issue, which is the hotline issue. Where do you see the next area of U.S.-Soviet uh, arms control negotiations uh, proving uh, out to be successful in the strategic arms or the conventional arms? Well, strategic arms. Our, uh, right now, we are we are seeking, in addition to the INF agreement, not linked to it in any way, but what we have called the START <coughs> agreement, the strategic, to, uh, and they themselves have expressed, well, they did at Reykjavik, a desire to cut to 50 percent of the strategic intercontinental ballistic missiles. And uh, I would like to see that step taken very definitely. Those are the missiles that I believe are the most destabilizing to the people. That thought that somebody can push a button and a half an hour later and large areas blow up. And uh, I think they're less afraid of conventional weapons. They know the, they've known warfare uh, with those. I believe that when we get to conventional weapons, that should be when we finally turn to look at the battlefield nuclear weapons. Because if you suddenly wipe those out, you would have automatically given the Soviet Union a vast advantage. Uh, at the moment, they're kind of equalizers, but they, can, in conventional weapons, uh, have a great supremacy over us. And so I think that they would have to be, they would have to be negotiated at the same time you started to change the balance in battlefield nuclear. You think you can establish some kind of understanding with the Soviet Union on regional conflicts and the dangers of regional conflicts, such as in Afghanistan or Cambodia or Southern Africa, even uh, Nicaragua? That has been one of our uh, subjects in all meetings and dealings with them uh, from the very beginning. Uh, the regional aspect of, of this, they're uh, supporting uh, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua as they are, and in fact, literally creating a Soviet base there. Uh, that and human rights uh, have been also very definitely one of the things that we think if we're to really improve relations, uh, those have to be taken care of. But you don't see these as necessarily linked to the START talks, uh, that they might be a part of the atmosphere of the negotiations, but not a specific linkage. That's right. I, I came here having declared, and I still believe, that the nuclear <coughs> The treaties all before that have gone on with limiting how many you can make or uh, uh, regulating uh, how high you will go in them, that is not what we need. We need reduction of weapons. And primarily, we need reduction of the first weapons that have ever come along that can simply wipe out the world. If anyone would stop and picture a world war <coughs> of the kind we've had twice now, Another world war, but with nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles and so forth. You have to say, how could there be a victory for anyone in that? You only have to look at Chernobyl and remember that that whole disaster was less than what one warhead would do, far less. But you could see that there'd be no victory. Uh, it would be total defeat because where would the people live that were left? The very earth itself would be poisoned. You have uh, expressed some concern over the past about the trustworthiness of the Soviets with respect to their treaty yes. obligations. We've now had uh, several Americans visiting their radar facility at Krasnoyarsk, uh, and there seems to be a fairly definite uh, conclusion that that, in fact, is in violation of a treaty. Do you believe they should dismantle the Krasnoyarsk radar facility? Um, it, it certainly is a violation of the ABM treaty. And at the same time, I have to believe that all the evidence indicates that they have been seeking what we're seeking in SDI. They've been seeking that for a longer period of time than we have, and spending more money at that. As a matter of fact, I'm just suspicious enough to think that some of their efforts to get us to give up on SDI uh, are because uh, they don't want us to have it before they have theirs. Does that mean that you do feel they should dismantle the Krasnoyarsk thing as being in, in violation of the uh, ABM treaty? Uh, yes, they could do that. Uh, 
they have denied that it is. They've said that it is for a different purpose and all, but then uh, that's what they would do in violating it. But the, it is a violation, and I think we, uh, we should look realistically and see if the ABM Treaty, uh, having been violated, is no longer of, of any importance. You have uh, had a a sort of a phrase that you've used about America in its relations with the world. You've used the phrase standing tall. Um, now, America in the 1990s is going to have to deal with the world in the context of, by almost any standards, including this morning's news of the $16 billion trade deficit for the preceding <coughs> month, with an international debt that will probably be in the range of a trillion dollars and a huge national debt that will put tremendous pressure on the domestic resources. How do we stand tall in foreign policy when we can't afford the necessary defense expenditures at home and have to be dependent upon other countries uh, when you have such a huge foreign debt? Well, in the first place, I divide the two debts. Uh, there can be no comparison in the imbalance of trade with the domestic debt and that has been going on now for more than half a century. As a matter of fact, uh, out on the mashed potato circuit for many years as a, as a after dinner speaker, uh, and I always did my own speeches, I was attacking this. And at that time, the people in the Congress, uh, the opposite party, were bringing it about because for 46 <coughs> or 50 years, uh, they had a majority in both houses of the Congress. And virtually every year, there was additional deficit. Uh, their answer was, well, it doesn't mean anything. We owe it to ourselves. Well, we don't owe it to ourselves anymore. And even that was not a legitimate answer. The, we must come to a balanced budget. We must do it by reducing government spending. And the other. The trade deficit, of course, we want to change. And we have been making great progress with our uh, trading partners in the Economic Summit who finally have agreed that we will review uh, all of the uh, GATT situation, the subsidies, the tariffs. We believe that we can compete if we've got a level playing field. And what we're striving for is not protectionism. That's no answer. It wasn't an answer with the Smoot-Hawley tariff in the Great Depression. It only spread the Depression around the world. But if we can come together, and we've made progress in this, some progress already, of eliminating uh, the barriers to trade outside. But again, it's hard for me to see the same kind of destruction in even the present imbalance of trade than we, uh, uh, that w than we see in, in the, just the national debt. I can't help but point out that for more than 70 years, at a time when this nation was growing into the great economic power it has become, every one of those years we had an imbalance of trade. As a young nation, uh, we, were, we had to buy from the rest of the world. We didn't have what it took. But the money we borrowed from abroad was invested in productive facilities in this country, whereas today the money that we borrow abroad is being used in consumption. If, as long as you have a deficit in this country where we're consuming more than we're producing, and it's not going into productive investment facilities which might ultimately repay it, almost every investment banker or economist that I deal with in my business career feels that uh, this domestic deficit is also, in that sense, ref reflecting more consumption than production, the root cause of our foreign deficit, well, and yet we are not addressing it. Well, now, wait a minute. There are some things, uh, you know what uh, Disraeli said about statistics, that there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. Now, some of the things in our balance of trade, uh, we do not include money for services. Now. A great part of our whole industry is service industry. And all we're counting in those other two, uh, in the, the balance of trade, we're counting things that they buy from us and things we buy from them. 
But even the thing is, in 1980, there was a manufacturing trade balance with the world of $17 billion in surplus. In 1986, there was a manufacturing trade deficit of $139 billion for a swing of 150 yeah. odd billion dollars in seven years. Uh, I mean, we are not looking at it at, at something that has the promise of a turnaround in terms of manufactured goods. How do we seek that and realize that balance and still sustain ourselves as a world power in the 1990s? I mean, the, well, the again, as I say, we are doing everything we can and working to level the playing field, to open markets. We've made great progress with even some of the more recalcitrant, uh, like Japan. And we recognize that, and we want to have a better balance of trade and have it not the imbalance based on the denial to us of markets and so forth, uh, the unusual subsidies on the other side. But again, I come back that the, um, the emergency situation in this country is our national deficit, our continuing to spend more on government uh, than we have. Do you favor that, do you favor then, the, for example, what, what, what the bill that uh, contained the principle that was passed in the Republican Senate in 1985 of freezing the COLA on Social Security expenditures as one way of getting a very rapidly growing part of our budget expenditures under control? No, because the truth of the matter is uh, figuring Social Security into the whole deficit situation is a job of bookkeeping and very frankly it's a little dishonest. The very fact that Social Security is self-sustaining and has a trust fund that cannot be used for anything else. You can't pay any of the other bills of government with the money that is paid in Social Security. But it is included in all of the bookkeeping because it actually reduces on paper the real amount of the deficit. It is a program that is not running a deficit. But the very fact of the presence of that fund there, if you include that in, makes our situation look better on paper. It's a bookkeeping trick. And I am one who says that it should no longer be considered. If the deficit is an emergency situation, then why not this domestic summit that people talk about? Why not get together and try to settle it before you leave office once and for all? We've been trying to settle it. If if the Congress had given me the budget I presented in 1981 for 1982, the cumulative deficit between 1982 and 1986 would be $207 billion less than it turned out to be. We have, I have never been given a, def, a, a budget that I submitted. I have always been given a reception on the Hill that says it's dead on arrival. <coughs> then what do they do? They turn around and there's one place where they're willing to cut. And that's when you get to national security, national defense. Every year they're willing to cut that and have cut it. But every year they add to the social programs. For example, they can point to $125 billion in cuts in defense spending that they have made, the Congress. But in the same period, they added $250 billion to the social spending. Now, I've been trying for a long time, and I, um, this was why I'm supportive of the program that was put into effect by the Congress of the Graham Rudman Hollings, and it has made no difference to the Congress. But in other words, a plan, there's no way you can balance the budget in one year. You set yourself on a track to balance it at a certain point, and then, please God, may we have a balanced budget amendment that will keep us from going back to the old ways. But no domestic summit, you're ruling that no. out. Well, it's been, uh, I have told them right now in the last statement I made that I will sit down and negotiate with them on every item if they will do some sensible things like approve a balanced budget amendment. Why shouldn't the president have what 43 governors have, the line item budget? Mr. President, getting back to the trade deficit, do you think that the dollar has fallen far enough? Uh, I would not like to see us go completely into uh, much more of a plunge than we than has taken place, but I think that it has been helpful. The I think it was, uh, uh, I don't think it was a case so much of the dollar 
was overpriced, as again, in the maneuvering, some of our trading partners uh, uh, were underpricing their own, uh, their own currency. Do you think that the Fed needs to do more to raise interest rates? Well, I'd rather wait and see what happens with this step that's just been taken. The figures that were released this morning show that what has been an increase recently uh, has leveled off. Mr. President, can I return just for a second to the ABM treaty? You said in view of the violations by the Soviets that you think it's time to reconsider that treaty. You think it's time to let that treaty expire or scrap that treaty? Well, no, I wouldn't favor that right now, and as a matter of fact, for a practical reason. I think that they are much more prepared uh, to take advantage uh, of such a thing than we are. In other words, they could suddenly expand their military might uh, to a far greater degree than, than we could if that treaty didn't exist. I know that our chiefs of staff don't want to walk away with the treaty, and maybe I was careless in what I, I said earlier. But uh, the, there is no question of their, their violation, and uh, hasn't the history of some 50-odd treaties since World War II been one of consistent violations of those treaties, including the one in which uh, the Eastern Bloc of nations was supposed to be uh, independent and free to uh, govern themselves. And, uh, Sir, I'd like to just switch a little bit to uh, the other part of the world. Did the Pope yesterday agree with you that the uh, Contras should be supported if Central American Peace Treaty is not in place? Well. I have always felt that it was not my place properly to quote the Pope uh, on anything that was discussed. But we did have a discussion, and I gave him some information that uh, we have as to the situation and our analysis of the treaty and so forth. I did not ask for a reply from him. One of the, uh, one of the things you must have spoken to him about or your analysis of the treaty shows, the Arias Treaty is that even if uh, it is put in place, the Sandinistas will be permitted to get Soviet and Cuban aid. Uh, I is told that a fatal defect of, I, of that I discussed. Treaty? He had also talked with uh, President Arias, but uh, I told him that our criticism was that there are loopholes there in that treaty that uh, we're positive the Sandinistas would take advantage well, does, of. Well, does the continuation of Soviet bloc assistance constitute a fatal flaw in your yes, mind? Yes, yes. Um, and what happens uh, afterwards? Let's say that uh, a treaty is put in place, they sign it down there, uh, it's easy for the Sandinistas to adhere to, and then they violate it. What besides more money for the Contras? The Contras have been disbanded at that point, supposedly. Well, What's, How are we going to get back into that? Well, this is one of the reasons why we say that the Contras have to be sustained until there is evidence an agreement has been put in place that does result in complete democratization of the country, which they promised during their revolution, uh, when they were a part of the revolution, only a part, against uh, Somoza. And uh, this, there's no, no question, but that uh, there must be a way by which we can know that they have not just uh, gone through some make-believe democratization. And until that is evident, that is why uh, the, the Contra Force, which they are the freedom fighters representing the people of Nicaragua who are entitled to the democracy that was promised them, um, this, until that is done, and we're guaranteed of that, that it won't be just their word for it. You, uh, when you met with the Contra leaders in Los Angeles, they proposed that the lethal component, component be put in escrow. Uh, I think Marlon said that you, that you were considering that. Uh, yes, this is certainly something for consideration. It isn't a case decision. of needing to, to spend now. It's a case that they must not clear the board of any opposition at the same time that then, as you've pointed out, with their military aid they're getting by way of Cuba, mainly from the Soviet Union, that uh, they can still be in charge as they, as they want to be. That, that must not happen. Does, that mean, does this mean that you would like to have them actually hold elections before you disband the Contras? We ought to keep the Contras in place until we actually have elections? Uh, either that or the elections be announced, and we know that the framework is there, that they would be legitimate. 
they claim that they are the duly elected government of Nicaragua, the Sandinistas. But look back at that election. For heaven's sakes, candidates had no access, were not allowed access to the media. They couldn't go on radio and tell their story. They couldn't go in the press and campaign. Uh, they were restricted even as to the meetings that they could hold. Their meetings, in fact, were broken up most of the time. The whole thing was a frame-up, and, um, and obviously so. Well, we must not have that happen again. It must be evident, and it must be evident to their neighbors and all. There must be a, an international, just as they made a proposal now to which Mr. Ortega has uh, agreed that he will go forward with, we must have the ability to see that it is definitely carried out. Uh, I'd like to take you to uh, another part of the world, uh, the Persian Gulf. Uh, one, one of the reasons uh, for our naval presence there is, is to blunt expanded Soviet influence and expansion in, the, in that region, that very strategically important region. Uh, yet since we have uh, had our warships in the region, the Soviets uh, have signed a series of economic agreements with Iran, uh, have received uh, uh, several diplomatic delegations from various countries, including Kuwait. Uh, and I wonder whether in that sense uh, we aren't succeeding, <coughs> that Soviet influence in the region is in fact expanding rather than contracting. Well. That, of course, has to do with the government that is presently in Iran, and that is such a reversal of what had been before, and a bad reversal. But what we're doing, actually, uh, you might point to a s tactic as being different or something. We have had a military force there since 1949. Uh, we have recognized that whole Middle East and uh, the the whole energy source that it uh, has as a place uh, that must be, uh, that we must uh, have a presence there, uh, just as we're trying to, still trying to bring about a, a peace between the Arab states and, and Israel. But, but how, how do we reduce Soviet influence in, in that region? It, it does seem to be, to be growing. And, that, and as you suggest, that is a very important well, strategic region. Just as, uh, what about Afghanistan? They're very open and overt with what they're doing there. And it is, uh, yes, there is an effort to move toward the, uh, toward the Middle East and toward the Gulf because they, they know the importance of it also. But that was not what inspired us to do what we're doing. Uh, we are... The, the Gulf states along the border of the Persian Gulf there, all of them are very vulnerable to Iran. Iran is the biggest force in the Middle East. And now uh, its refusal to uh, join in a peace movement to end the war with Iraq and so forth, uh, I don't think we have any choice. But to those who were so upset and concerned and seemed to think that we were going it alone, uh, look at what is happening, nation after nation, and now expanding their own naval forces. And a number of ships are on the way and a number have been added. They're, whether it's the, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, uh, England, France, the forces are growing there and they're growing in order to really basically to support one thing that is legitimate for all of us the freedom of the seas. If, uh, if uh, you, you've said about the Iran-Iraq war that, that uh, it should end with no victor and no vanquished, right. uh, if it ended that way, uh, would you sit down with the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, across a table to talk about uh, a new relationship between the United States and Iran? I think you better ask him that question. Would he sit down with me? He may be I, you know, I'm the great Satan, and you might be disappointed that I didn't show horns when I, <laughs> when I got there. 
<laughs> but uh, no, I'm willing to talk uh, with anyone and things of that kind where it's legitimate and, and between governments. Uh, incidentally, uh, may I point out a correction to something out of all the months of investigation that some of the misconceptions that still exist, uh, we were not doing business with the Ayatollah in that covert operation that subsequently was exposed. We were doing business with individuals who wanted to discuss a relationship with the government that might follow the Ayatollah because at that time there were uh, such reports of his health that almost every other day we were hearing the word that uh, he wouldn't live out the week and so forth. I don't know what has happened to those people that we were talking to, but uh, they were obviously, uh, we had to have a covert operation or their lives would have been in danger. But we had the assurance of the intelligence forces, very capable forces of another nation in the of uh, some package of excise taxes in combination with spending reductions as a way of reducing the budget deficit to stabilize these markets and prevent the economy from going into a tailspin? There's only one way that I believe we should ever look at a tax increase for this problem. That is if and when, with the cooperation of the Congress, we have reduced government spending down to where we can look at it and honestly all of us agree it cannot be reduced any further, that it is, we've reached that point. And then, if there is still not enough revenue, then would be a time to consider a change in the, in the tax. But right now, I have to stay stubbornly opposed to any increase in taxes because there has been no real effort to, uh, to meet the spending problem of government. Now, I'm, I'm not alone in this. Uh, John F. Kennedy and his tax program, which was very similar to our tax reduction, and he fought for it and got it. And uh, his, his statements uh, sound very much the same as mine about why we had to have that, but also the result was the same of our tax cuts. There was more revenue at the lower rates than we were getting at the higher rates. And as a matter of fact, I quote a man, I don't, I don't know that they called him economists back in his day, but many, many centuries, and centuries, but certainly decades, and I believe a few centuries ago, a man named Ibn Khaldun said, in the beginning of the empire, the rates were low and the revenues were great. He said, at the end of the empire, the rates were great and the revenue was low. Right now, with our tax cuts, we are getting a major increase in revenues from the income tax, more than we were getting at the higher rates, because suddenly there's an incentive for people to earn more. With a name like that, and Mr. President, he should be an economist. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I always thought that was Art Laffer. <laughs> you know, I've, I've, since I've had a, another interview already this morning, I can't remember now whether I told you something or told the other one. Have I told you about the war on poverty and the figures between 1960 and 1985? Good. Let me just tell you the figures, <laughs> and then we'll go. I'll, I'll go. Here is proof of what I've said about the government and the responsibility is spending for our deficits. And for these jokers that are now taking out ads to say I'm responsible for the deficits, the president can't spend a penny without the permission of the Congress. In 19, we know Lyndon Johnson in his term brought about the war on poverty, which poverty won. He brought that about, and from the middle 60s, 1965 to 1980, a 15-year period, with that great social program in place, the budgets of our government increased roughly to five times what they were in 1960, 60, uh, yeah, in 1965, to what they were in 1980, they were five times greater. The deficit was 38 times greater in just those 15 years. It is structural, it is built in to the structure of our government, and you're not going to change it just by adding more revenues to government and letting us go on 
with what increases constantly, we have to make those structural changes. And then, as I say, if and when that has happened, and we still then are not taking a high enough percentage from the people in taxes, then is when you should look to tax as a solution to revenue. But right now we've increased the revenues tremendously. And we have, we have made uh, many reductions, but not enough to, to count, in simply the improvement in, this, in the management of government. That's one thing the Congress couldn't interfere with. But the changes that we have made to business-like procedures in government have amounted to billions and billions of dollars. I think we'll leave that point where we tried everything we can at about sort of January 1989. <laughs> That's what, I'm, that's what I'm working very hard to do, but um, at the same time, I'll be working very hard to see that whoever follows me in here has the same idea. <laughs> Good to see you looking so well. And your friends say that you're, uh, you're going to be back on the lecture circuit, back on the radio when you leave. Sure. The job won't be done. Yeah. It's a matter of fact, I've already admitted that to see something I could not see, but, and that is I would like to get the Constitution changed and restore the democratic right of the people of this country to vote for whoever they wanted to vote for, for the president, and as many times as they wanted to vote for. Do you want to do your old radio show again? I mean, it's just three times. I haven't time thought about that. <laughs> you fellas are in that business, you know that's kind of a monkey on your back. <laughs> <laughs> president, thank you very much. Well, it's very nice well, to see you. Mr. President, again. thank you so much. Good to see you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks. Good to see you. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you.